you so much. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Good. Uh, it's good to be with you again. Uh, one of the joys has been over the last number of years being able to uh, connect uh, with Numa. My wife and I, uh, Astrid, we go to Horizon Church, uh, and uh, whether it's you know coming and visiting and helping lead worship or preach, uh, we uh, feel a kinship with Numa Church, and so it's always a pleasure uh, to come. And we love uh, Nick and Sarah. Uh, you might notice my wife isn't here. Uh, she would have loved to be here, but we have a, a nine-week-old baby. Boy boy that has the sniffles, um, and so they're at home resting today. I, <laughs> there's some pouty lips. Uh, he has some pouty lips because he's... Um, anyway, so uh, uh, they, I don't know if she's watching online, but they are hello, Astrid and Bjorn. Um, uh, but yeah, we always love coming and visiting. Uh, this morning, I loved how Sarah started. She mentioned uh, this idea of encouragement, and it's my hope uh, to come and bring an encouragement through the word. Uh, one of the joys is when you're a guest, uh, you get to kind of like uh, bring the encouragement. It's not my job generally to bring the hammer when you're visiting, um, so it's <laughs> we'll leave that for your pastors. No, um, but it's come to encourage and build people up. And there's a message that I've been wanting to share for a little while uh, that I haven't been able to share, and I'm grateful for this morning to be able to bring it. So if you have your Bible, uh, if you we're going to be in two main uh, portions of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 13, uh, it's up on the screen, verse 20 to 21, and Acts chapter 3, uh, 1 to 10. Uh, you can put your fingers in both. Uh, maybe you've got ribbons in your Bible. You can then uh, kind of mark, because we're going to be hanging out in those two uh, verses. Uh, we'll get the uh, scriptures in front of us. We'll read them out loud, um, and then we'll pray. Um, if you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. All right, let's read the scriptures. For our first one, Hebrews chapter 13, uh, it says this. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip, someone say equip, you with everything good that you may do his will. Working. Someone say working. working. In us that which is pleasing. Somebody say pleasing. In his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. That was the Ryan translation right there at the end. Uh, next, if you want to turn to Acts chapter 3, I love this uh, the story of Scripture, and we're going to read it and come back to it as we think about um, what God wants to speak this morning. And it says this, starting in verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Verse 3, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and Walk. Verse 7, it gets even better. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gates of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This morning, I want to share a message that's entitled, I'm Ready. Uh, before we go further, let me just quickly pray one more time. God, we thank you for your presence that's here with us. And God, I pray that as we look to your powerful word, that you would speak to each heart. God, we open our hearts, our ears, our minds to you, that you would come and fill us. Would you come, encourage us. Holy Spirit, would you come, empower, enable me uh, to, to make much of you, Jesus, this morning. And so, God, we thank you that we're together. We thank you for what you want to do. And in your precious name we pray, amen. 
So I'd mentioned earlier, my wife and I uh, recently had a baby nine weeks and one day ago, uh, which is an amazing testimony to God's faithfulness. Uh, we'd walked through uh, infertility for 10 years, and the Lord answered, and now we're holding the fulfillment. Amen. Um, at some point, I'm going to preach a sermon that God's fulfillment sometimes comes in dirty diapers, but that's another day. <laughs> Um, but it's quite this joy that we have a baby, and I can think back to uh, while Astrid was pregnant and he was growing inside. Sometimes you get scanned, and that's like super cool uh, that you get to see how your baby's doing and uh, get to see his heartbeat. Um, but as we were nearing uh, the day for delivery, uh, one thing that's cool is my baby was born in the same hospital that I was born in, and that just kind of seems really cool. Uh, and we only live two blocks away from where we grew up, so it's just kind of cool. Oh, uh, the, I can show you a picture if you want. Uh, here's a picture of Astrid and Bjorn. Um, this is just last weekend. We were on Vancouver Island. So that's our chubby baby. His name is Bjorn. Uh, if you notice, his cheeks and double chin, which we're grateful for in Jesus' name. Uh, and that's my beautiful wife, Astrid. Um, but again, I can think back to as her belly was growing, as he was growing inside, we often would get uh, certain reactions when people see uh, pregnant people. Uh, some people have a really inappropriate response, which is to touch the belly. Uh, I'd encourage you that if you see someone with a rotund belly, not to touch it, whether you think they're pregnant or not. Can we all agree on that? Is that okay? <laughs> There's a thing called, you know, your personal space and touching someone's belly is far outside those bounds. Uh, so some people would, you know, touch the belly. Uh, we would also receive a lot of unsolicited advice uh, where people would say, okay, you're about to have a baby. Here's some advice of how you can be a rock star parent. And some of that was good, but also sometimes you're like, I don't think that's going to work. Uh, bless your heart. But what we often were asked as well, especially me, not so much Astrid, people would say, are you, are you ready? You know, are you ready for a baby? A baby is going to change everything. And they would ask me that question, are you ready? And I would pause and I would think about it for a moment. I'm like, I think I'm ready. This is our first baby, so I don't know what it means to be fully ready. Sometimes what they meant is, you know, is there a room in your house that's painted blue with Noah's Ark painted on the wall and a crib, which we don't have. He sleeps anyway uh, in our room because he's just a baby. Um, but they would ask these questions and I would think to myself, am I ready? Like, I didn't doubt for a second my wife was ready. She read everything to read, talk to people. I'm sure if she wanted to become a midwife, she could pass the test tomorrow. She was ready. But again, I, hadn't, I had some books, but I'll be honest with you, and pastors watching, I didn't read all the books that I was given to prepare myself. And so I started thinking to myself, am I ready? And I, I realized that billions of men have been dads. And I'm sure that I can kind of get ready for it when the baby comes. And we'll just figure out as it goes. And one thing I'm grateful for is that's generally kind of work. Even though there are times where I definitely don't feel ready. Where I didn't, went, leading into him being born, I didn't feel like, man, is this going to work? Am I going to know how to change his diaper and deal with him crying and the lack of sleep and all those king things make him happy? And I think for believers, sometimes we don't always feel ready. We read a text in Hebrews where the desire for the author of Hebrews, he gives this prayer to the people, is that they would be able to do the will of God to be able to please God. But I think sometimes in our own hearts, we have this feeling of, I'm not ready. I don't have what, I don't have what it takes, I don't know, to necessarily always do the will of God. Like, I know what God's will is generally for my life, but then there's this distance between me knowing it and me doing it and feeling that I'm equipped and established to do it. You're like, I'm just a regular Christian. I made it up on Sunday morning. I'm here. Isn't that enough? Now you want me to do God's will. I don't know if I'm ready. But I want to encourage us, as I've discovered, that with help and my wife and just things, I became ready to be a dad. And I think I'm pretty ready. We're learning a lot every day. But that you are ready to do God's will in your life. I want to encourage you today that this feeling to, might say that I don't know if I can 
is something that actually doesn't align up with what God's word would speak to us, that you are equipped, you are enabled, and you will be empowered to fulfill God's will in your life. So let's walk through and look at our text again uh, this morning. We got two of them, and I'm excited as we look at them. Uh, This idea that, again, God is going to equip us and prepare us to do his will. First, in the book of Hebrews, we have what's called the benediction. Someone say benediction. Benediction Uh, benediction just sounds like an old thing. Uh, Sometimes when I preach at the end, I'll read a benediction. It's kind of like sometimes there's different parts of a church service. And near the end, someone will read a scripture and bless you as you go. And that's what the author of Hebrews is doing. It's the end of the letter. He's written this letter uh, to a Christian audience that often has a Jewish background. And he's written to a group of people that he wants to encourage that you can endure, that you can live for Jesus. And what he does to encourage them that they can live for Jesus is he tells them about Jesus that Jesus is our great high priest. He talks about what Jesus has accomplished for them to encourage them to understand the truth of who God is that then is something that influences the way we live our lives. And he finishes the book. He's been teaching all these great things, again, encouraging them that you could live for him, you can endure, you can be faithful to God. And he gives just a two-verse benediction. It's kind of a summary, kind of a recap of what he's been saying, a wish for them, a prayer for them. And it's my prayer for you this morning as well, that the God of peace brought again from the dead, from our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will. And so again, he's calling back on all these things he's been thinking about Jesus, uh, all these different truths, and that they would then shape and encourage those, the audience of Hebrews, but us today, that we too can do God's will. It's an encouragement for us. And so what we want to do is we want to look, um, we want to look at this text. How do we know that we're ready? What does it mean that we've been equipped, we've been prepared to live for God? There's three main things I want to look at. And as we do each one, I want to look at our story in Acts chapter 3 as an example of what might it look like for us to live for God. If you're with me, say, I'm with you. Here we go. The first thing is this, is that in the text, it says that, again, he has this prayer, may the God of peace... By the blood of the covenant, may he equip you with every good thing. The first thing I want to think about this morning is the idea of prepared. That you are prepared, or as the author says here, equipped. That God has done something in you to equip you, to fit you, to complete you, to enable you to live for him. That word equip uh, is, is past tense. It's something that's already happened. That in order for you to know, to, le- to follow God's will, to please him, there's some things that are already been established that will enable you to do God's will. They're already done. They're already finished. They're equipped you. It's kind of this idea of like camping, that you've been fitted out. Everything that you need, the tent's been packed, uh, you got all the stuff going in there. What do camp? I didn't camp growing up. What do you need to camp? All those things are ready for you in your journey, that you would be able to live for God. We can see some of them in the text. And I think in verse 1, we see some of the most important things that have already been done that equip the believer to be able to do God's will. At first, it talks about, may the God of peace. One of the things that equips us to do God's will is that we have been made right with God. If you're a believer, you've trusted in him, we can have peace with God because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. We celebrated this morning as we partook of communion. What this reminder is, is is that we were once enemies of God, but now we are not. We're no longer strangers. He calls us his own, that we've been brought to peace with God. And that's a foundation for us to do his will, that we belong to him. We've been made right with him. What we need to be able to live for him, the foundation of that is that we've been made right with him that can lead us to live a right life for him. 
This is an encouragement that you are at peace with God. You belong to him. And how has that happened? It says, by the blood of the eternal covenant. Something that's already happened is that Jesus, through his own blood, has established a new covenant for you and for me. If you are in Christ, part of your preparation to enable you to live for God is the new covenant with better promises, with a better hope. Part of the reality for every believer is now that we can know God, we can know that we are forgiven. Part of the new covenant is that he is writing his law upon our very hearts, that God has come to dwell in us. This is the truth of who you are, believer, that you are prepared because the new covenant promises belong to you. That he has come and he dwells upon you, dwells within you. A marker of the new covenant is the Holy Spirit that has been poured upon, upon the new covenant, New Testament church. All of these things have already happened. Sometimes we wonder, am I ready to do God's will? Well, I want to encourage you is that you've been prepared in so many ways. The ones we've mentioned and even more. So let's look at this story in Acts chapter 3, and let's see what they would say. So we have this amazing, I love this story. Peter and John, they're doing their normal, everyday kind of life. They're going to the temple to pray. This would have been their habit. This is what they would have done every day. Uh, What's interesting, and I think about it, and we don't have time. It's another sermon for another time. What's interesting is that they perhaps walked by this man every day. And so we have them going. This is their habit. Just like we have a habit of gathering together to go to church. Habits of reading scripture. Habits of just doing everyday life. When it comes to doing God's will, there are some things that are true for all of us. The Bible says it's... I I know some people wonder, oh, I don't know if I know what God's will is for my life. Well, the Bible says it's God's will that you would be grateful. If you want to know where to start, start with gratitude. That is clearly God's will for your life. But there's some things that are true for all believers for all time, that it's God's will that we would be holy. It's God's will that we would know him. It's God's will that we would walk with a faith community as we journey towards Jesus. This is God's will for your life. But God also has not only a will for your life that is kind of general for everybody, but unique things that he's called you to do. Unique things, unique talents and gifts and purpose and destiny that's on your life. Things that before the foundation of the world that he's prepared, good works for you to walk into. It's his will that you would walk in those things. He's prepared them, and it's his will, your, his will for your life that you would walk in them. But we even experience God's will in our daily life. God's setting things up, interactions, different people, and it's his will that we would encourage them and we would bless them. And we see that in this story. They're going about their everyday life. They see this man who's been, he, he can't walk from birth. And he get, every day he's, he gets brought to the same spot and he asks for, uh, asks for alms, asks for money so that he can survive. And then it says that Peter and John, and they said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Man, he was expecting some pocket change, and he got something way, way better. And even better than the healing of his physical legs. His life was about to change. And then it says, but Peter said, I have no silver and gold. I have no silver and gold. Sometimes when it comes to us following God and doing his will in our life, we believe that we can't because of what we don't have. We'd say, maybe if I was as eloquent with my words as Pastor Nick, then I could share the gospel with somebody. And Nick's saying, that's not me. Maybe that's somebody else. But maybe I, I, I don't have that. Or, or maybe I don't have Bible college training. Uh, I, again, I'm the dean of students at Pacific Life Bible College, and part of my minimum requirement is that I would encourage you to partner with us as we equip the church, uh, equip men and women for spirit-empowered ministry. If you want to look to talk about Bible college, you can talk to me. Okay, that's my pitch. But we might think to ourselves, I can't do God's will. He has so much. He wants me to talk about him. He wants me to be faithful. He wants me to change the world. But I I don't have, you know, Bible college education. I don't really know even all the books of the Bible in order. I can possibly do God's will in my life. 
We might not think, you know, I'm, I'm too old. I, you know, I don't have, you know, the youthful vitality to do God's will in my life. What we often do is we think about what we don't have. And then it causes us to actually not enter into what God has for our lives. I love that Peter and John, they speak to him and say, silver and gold we don't have. As if the amount of money you had, the good looks and talents and gifts you had were the foundation for your faithfulness. It's not the foundation for your faithfulness. The actual foundation for your faithfulness is who God is and what he's already accomplished in your life. That he has made you right with God, that he's welcomed you into his new covenant, given you the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John, they look and they say, what we, silver and gold we don't have, but what we do have in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Peter and John understood that they had a way more than earthly possessions, way more than skills, that they had the very God of the universe living inside of them, equipping and enabling them to be able to give this man something that he really needed. He needed to be healed because they knew what they did have. They did have the Holy Spirit. They did have salvation. They did have the gospel. They did have a great shepherd that was leading them that day to meet this gentleman and then be able to pray for him and see him healed in Jesus' name. If we had more time, I, th I think one of the things that they had that day was actually the gift of faith the gift of faith to heal, and that would be another day we can think about some other time. But they had something to give. And I want to encourage you, when it comes to living, with, living for God, that you are equipped. That you have what you need to live for Him. And so I encourage us not to think about what we don't have, but to think about what we do have in Him as a foundation and as a base, that we would have a right understanding of who He is, what He's done, which then stirs us on to live for Him. You are equipped. That word equipped can be, maybe you have a different translation, is sometimes translated as complete. In Christ, you are complete because God sees his son. He's working on you, but God sees you. Uh, in some cases, it's this idea of that we've been healed. That in, in the original language is this picture of a bone that was broken, being made right, that we've been made right, that we've been healed. And now this is the foundation. You are prepared to do God's will. If someone believes that this morning, say amen. amen. Again, our security of our equipment isn't based on our strength. It's based on who God is. Uh, because of our strong God, I have peace when I'm afraid, power when I'm weak, guidance when I'm lost, and security when I fail. You can live for him because what he's already done in your life. You are prepared. The next thing I want to think about when it comes to how can I say I'm ready we can say that we're ready to live God's way, to bring him pleasure because of power. Uh, random note, I was chatting with Les a couple weeks ago at a fundraiser, and he asked me the question, Ryan, what letter will your sermon be brought to, uh, will, be, you know, will be the sermon be brought to you by? It's brought to us by the letter P, okay? If you're wondering what all my points are, it is P. How do we please God? Well, first, you need to know that you're prepared and you also have power. Someone say power. power. Now, that's, now, let's say it like the word actually means power. Say power. power. That, that's pretty good. Okay. So again, back to Hebrews. It tells us, now the God of peace who brought from the dead our Lord Jesus. Our God is strong. He can raise the dead to life. If you were unsure about his strength, he can raise the dead to life. The great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will. Everything you need that you, to do his will, God equips us with it. Everything good. And then it says, working in us. That God is working in you. That God is empowering you to do his will will. Did you know that? Because sometimes we feel, I'd love to do God's will, but God's kind of told me what to do, and now I feel like he's kind of left me alone. That is not the case for the believer. It's God's desire that you would do the things he's designed for you to do. It's God's desire that you'd be grateful and holy to be a great mom or dad, to be a great employee, to tell people about Jesus, to pray for the sick, all of these things. And God not only desires it for you, but he empowers 
you to do it. Believer, you are not alone. The things that God's called you to do, he's with you to do it. God hasn't left you alone. God wants to give you the power. It says that he is working in you. That's active. That's ongoing. Did you know that God is working in your life right now? Because God desires you to walk in freedom and wholeness, to advance his kingdom, to accomplish the things that he's given you to do. And he's going to continue to work in your life. The question is, is, will you work with him? So we then go back to our our story in Acts chapter 3. And they say, silver and gold we don't have. They're not rich in money, but they're rich in other things. But what we do have in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And then what happens? The guy gets up and starts dancing, which is an amazing story. So he gets up, he's never walked, and now he's leaping around praising God. Why? Because G- was it Peter and John's ability? No. no. It was Jesus Christ himself healing, working in them to accomplish what God had given them to do that day. God set the whole thing up, and God worked in them. They prayed in the name of Jesus. When we pray in Jesus' name, it's a recognition that it is his power at work and not our own. One author says it this way, because of the name of Jesus stands for the reality of Jesus. That's why we, when we pray in Jesus' name, his name stands for who he is. When Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk, he meant, I'm speaking the words, but Jesus is healing you. When I speak in his name with the faith that he has now given me for your healing, he is acting and not me. This is great news. Sometimes we think, I couldn't possibly do it. But Jesus is with you, enabling you and empowering you to do his will. It says in Hebrews that it's through Jesus Christ. If you're uncertain if you can do God's will in any given moment, I want you to take a pause. I want you to remember you already ready. You've been prepared. But right now, Jesus is currently working in your life. Maybe you're trying to overcome a temptation or sin in your life, and you're feeling the urge. Pause and recognize that Jesus is present right now, working in you to live for him, to make a choice that would honor him. Maybe you're about your daily life, uh, and you, re- you feel that sometimes God just leads us, right? He's a good shepherd. Shepherd leads us by his voice. And you sense he's leading you, and, he's, and maybe he puts this on your heart. I want you to give this person fill in the blank. And you think, oh, I couldn't do that. I, I don't have the time. Remember in that moment, Jesus is present with you. His presence with you is the power for you to be able to live for him and to enable you to do what pleases him. It says this in Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God who works in you. Someone say, in you. In you. This is one of the beautiful benefits of the new covenant, that God lives in you. So it's God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is, I, I know this is simple, but it's an encouragement because sometimes I think we don't remember Sometimes we don't live actively in this truth, in this reality, that is God who is in you to not only will you, which means that you might not even have the motivation. Sometimes you say, God, I want to live for you, but I don't feel like it. Ask him to help because he can help you do not only with the power, but the motivation to live for you, live for him. So God, would you help me? And let's trust that he will. But God works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The power that you need to live for him is available because the power of his presence. Throughout scripture, Jesus would tell people when they're about to do something scary that would require a lot of faith. Random note, the Bible says in Hebrews just a few chapters before that, we, that for us to please God, we, we need faith. That that's what pleases him is when we live in faith, which <laughs> if that means we have to step into things that are above our ability. Because if it was just our own strength, it wouldn't be faith. It'd just be our own power. But often in Scripture, when someone would do something, God called them to do something big and scary. God would say, fear not. Why? 
for I am with you. God's presence in your life is the power that you can do his will and bring him pleasure. The last thing I want to think about this morning when it comes to us being ready to live for God. When we understand that we have been prepared, God's done some amazing things. When we understand that there is power, that God is present with us in every moment to enable us and and empower us to do his will. The ultimate result is praise. Someone say praise. In the benediction, it finishes that, that God would help us to bring, to do his will, to please him. And then it says to him forever be glory forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. That's praise. That's glory. That's worship. We were singing praise to God this morning. And your life can sing praise to God as you live for him, as you do his will in your life, that God gets the praise. We can see that in our story in Acts chapter 3. This man is healed, gets up, and starts praising the Lord, singing, dancing. Does Peter and John get the glory? No. God gets the glory. It says that people are awed. They're in wonder and amazement what what had happened to him. That when we live for the Lord, when we do the things he set before us to do, that God gets the glory. In our life, that our life is for him. It's for worship for him. But also people will see what God can do. They will encounter his love as you go and are sent into your community to share with compassion and joy. That God gets the glory when we live for him. But sometimes we, God gets the glory, but it might lead to some persecution. And the story in Acts chapter 3 we discovered that the religious leaders are a little bit upset about what's gone on, which is kind of an odd thing to be upset about someone that's been healed, but they don't like what's happening because they're not in control. It's not about them. And so they actually bring Peter and John before like a kind of a trial to say, hey, stop talking about Jesus because everyone's following him. They don't like it. But guess what? They, They recognize Peter and John are common, ordinary people, just like you and me. But God is working in them, and they decide, uh, they, they decide anyway that even though that there's persecution, people telling them not to live for Jesus, they will do it anyway. Sometimes the result of living for him is that some people will be upset, but ultimately he gets the glory as we choose to live for him, accomplishing his will in his, his will in our lives brings him pleasure, but also brings him praise that he would be glorified in your life, a living sacrifice, a life dedicated to him to accomplish his will in the world, empowered by him, and ultimately to point to who he is. You are ready. You might be struggling today. I don't know if I can do what God's called me to do in every area. There's some areas you're nailing it, but there's other areas you're just unsure. I don't know. I'm scared. Maybe God's put a big uh, dream in your heart and you know it's from him. And you can sense that calling, that longing in your heart to honor God in that way. But you have a list of all the things that you don't have of why you can't. God's called you to do it. He will enable you to do that very thing. You are ready to follow Jesus. You are ready to do his will, ready to bring him pleasure because of who he is, what he's done, how he's working in you, and that ultimately he would get the credit for it as well. 